Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Chronic Inflammation Summit. I'm your host, Dr. David Jockers. And today we are going to talk about leaky gut endotoxemia and its relationship with chronic inflammation. We're going to talk all about the microbiome, this condition of leaky gut syndrome, another key condition called endotoxemia. We're going to talk about probiotics, intermittent fasting, how that actually impacts the microbiome. We're going to talk about key nutrients to support gut health and reduce, reduce gut-based inflammation. And so our guest is Kieran Krishnan. He is a research microbiologist. He's been involved in the dietary supplement nutrition market for the past 17 years. Kieran also established a clinical research organization where he's designed and conducted dozens of clinical trials in human nutrition. And he is the chief scientific officer at Microbiome Labs, which has some of the best products to support the microbiome. They've got uh, Mega Sporbiotic and Mega IgG and Mega Mucosa, some great products that we'll talk about why he developed these products and how they may be able to benefit you as we go through this presentation. Well, Kieran, welcome to the summit. Thank you so much for having me, David. Absolutely. Well, it's always such an honor to talk with you. You are one of the leading minds when it comes to the microbiome and how inflammation really develops in the gut. And so let's start by talking about what the microbiome is and how important that is to our health. Yeah. You know, the, there's many ways to describe the microbiome. So the scientific definition is really the collection of microorganisms and all of their genetic elements as it exists in relationship to the host. And of course, we are the host. So uh, one thing that, that is not mistaken at all is that we are covered in microbes, right? Every millimeter of our body, for the most part, has microbes in it, and they play a very significant role in how we function. Um, and when it comes to, to kind of guarding and protecting the body, that is um, kind of an understated uh, function of the microbiome. You know, they are really the guards of what enters our body and how our immune system responds to the various things that we get exposed to. So a great example of that is the digestive tract, right? So the digestive tract, when we swallow something or something enters our digestive tract inadvertently through our nose, through our eyes, through our ears, which of course, all of it drains into our digest into our throat, which goes down our digestive tract. Um, it's the largest sampling site of the body. And the digestive tract is still considered outside of the body, right? And that's something that people really need to wrap their heads around, even though it seems like it's inside because it's going in, but it's a tube that's open at both ends. And as a tube that's open at both ends, even though it's physically inside the shell, nothing can actually move through the digestive tract without getting sampled in the mucosal layer of the digestive tract, right? And then it has to make its way past the intestinal epithelium, which are those cells, the single line of cells that, that guard the border, if you will, before things can move through and enter into the blood circulation. Once it gets past that, then it's officially in the body. And the guards that are, that are protecting us at that layer is the microbiome. And the microbiome, if it's dysfunctional, will have less protective effect. If it's functional, will elicit amazing protective effects that improves our health and wellness outcomes. Yeah, that's a, just a great overview of it. And so we know that, again, it's like one big hollow tube, the intestinal lining, but what is leaky gut syndrome, right? So leaky gut syndrome or intestinal permeability is a commonly discussed term in natural health. Can you break that down for us? Yeah, you know, uh, that barrier I mentioned. So uh, remember when something goes into the into the hollow tube and if it's in the, the space of the tube, the open space of the tube, that's called the lumen. And the lumen is still mm -hmm. considered outside of the body. Now, when it has to go past the lumen, which is the mucosal layer and then the intestinal epithelium. And in fact, I have a diagram here that might help illustrate yeah. that. So, so this part here would be the lumen. This is the tube. And then uh, the layer below the tube is the mucosa. This is the first part of the lining of the intestinal tract. And then you go through the mucosa. There's a couple of different layers of the mucosa. And then this is the intestinal epithelial cells, right? Mm -hmm. So they line uh, the, the intestinal lining. Now, once things are allowed to go in from the lumen past the mucosa, past the intestinal mm -hmm. um, epithelium, and it enters into this layer, which is called the basolateral layer, this is where it enters into circulation. 
Now it's officially inside the body. In a healthy gut, what you have is a healthy microbiome that exists here that provides a, a significant amount of protection by uh, producing this mucus layer, by defining the immune response in this mucus layer, by helping the intestinal epithelial cells regenerate themselves, by keeping the space in between the intestinal epithelial cells tight, called the tight junctions, making this a true barrier to entry. Mm. And it becomes highly selective, what is allowed to move through and into circulation. For the most part, it's nutrients, right? There are nutrients that we get from our digestion that have to go from this tube part, the lumen, pass all of this into circulation so we can absorb and utilize the nutrients. And of course, the microbiome also produces a number of nutrients that are then required to be absorbed through this whole system and enter our circulation. Now, when the microbiome is messed up and they cannot play that guarding role, then the system looks more like this, right? Where this mm. whole system is broken down and you've got things that are leaking to non-specifically that are not supposed to enter circulation all the time. Things like viral toxins, bacterial toxins, uh, environmental toxins, mold, and so on. Things that just leak through non-specifically and enter circulation. And once it enters circulation, it causes systemic inflammation. And that systemic inflammation becomes the foundation for the vast majority of chronic illnesses. So intestinal permeability or the, or the colloquial term leaky gut really is that breakdown in control mm. at that barrier. And it starts with a dysfunctional microbiome. Yeah, it's so good. And, and of course, we know that, um, you know, really throughout the history of mankind, systemic infections have killed more people throughout the history than anything else. And so our, our immune system is really, really on alarm for seeing large bacterial debris or just large proteins mm -hmm. in our bloodstream. And it creates kind of, it just amplifies inflammation when it starts to see that. And so let's also talk about endotoxemia and mm -hmm. what that is and how that helps trigger inflammation. Yeah, so that's a that's a really uh, fancy word that we can break down for your audience. So endotoxemia, the endo component of it means that it's a it's a toxin that comes from within, right? So versus an exotoxin, an exotoxin mm -hmm. is one you'd get exposed to outside, and of course, the easy solution to an exotoxin is move yourself away from the toxin, right? If you live in a house with lots of mold that's an exotoxin with all the mold toxins present, you move out of that house. It's an easy solution. The problem with an endotoxin is the toxin is generated constantly inside your body. And because it's generated inside your body, you can't get away from it. And the emia part of it, the endotoxemia, just means it's now in the blood. Mm -hmm. So there's a toxin that's produced in your body that is allowed to enter the blood. And that kind of goes back to this leakiness uh, in the gut, right? If we go back to this illustration, one of the things that happens up here in the lumen, where all the microbes in your microbiome exist, there are bacteria that are called gram-negative bacteria. And gram-negative bacteria um, are, and that makes up, I think, somewhere around 70% of the normal microbes that live in your gut. They produce a compound called LPS, lipopolysaccharide. And that LPS is, is really important for the bacteria. It's functional in many ways, and it sits in the membrane of the bacteria. So imagine this is the bacterial cell. It sits as a transmembrane um, component of the, of the bacterial cell. And when it's in the bacteria, it's sitting in the membrane, it doesn't cause any issue. And of course, it's in the lumen for the most part, in the tube, so not inside the body. Now, when bacteria die and the cell breaks up, this LPS is released and is by itself as a highly potent toxin. Right, and it's and it's not a problem if it stays in the lumen. But when your gut is leaky, that LPS is going to leak into your circulation, and that's how you end up with the anemia part of it, where it's endotoxins that are produced inside the gut, and then now they're leaking into circulation. And then there's just, I mean, I I myself have reviewed maybe 400 published studies on how endotoxemia, the LPS endotoxemia itself acts as a root cause for a huge variety of chronic illnesses. Um, so that whole pathophysiology of how this leaking in of a toxin that's constantly being produced in your gut is the foundation for so many chronic mm. illnesses, you know? So yeah, because so many people can, they may not just have gut issues, right? So, mm -hmm. so most people in society think, that if they have digestive issues, they have a digestive problem, but if they have brain fog, depression, anxiety, joint pain, that it's not rooted in the digestive tract, that it's, mm -hmm. it's localized in those areas. But endotoxemia, understanding that really helps us understand how 
what's happening in the gut can really impact everything else happening in the body. Absolutely. You know, um, and, and a lot, I've talked to many people before that say, you know, I don't need to really focus on my gut because I don't have gut issues. Um, and that's an important point because they don't feel like they have the cramping and the bloating and the things that other people they see suffering. Yeah. Uh, but they do have anxiety. They do have skin issues. They've got, you know, potentially mold issues on their body. You know, they've got sleep issues. They've got energy issues. All of these things are derived from the co command center, which is the gut. The gut is the largest sampling site in your body. It's the largest amount of exposure you get to outside things. And, and it's the largest component of your immune system, right? So everything that happens in your body is impacted by the gut. And it doesn't require primary gut issues to, to actually have a, um, an issue with your microbiome and your digestive tract. Yeah. And microbiome researchers like you talk a lot about bacterial diversity, Let's talk about what that is. And I know the, the last time we spoke, you talked about like the different layers of bacteria in our intestine and how all of them need to be fed appropriately and how oftentimes we can get an overdominance of certain layers. So I'd love to go into more detail on that. Yeah. Um, so diversity is critical, right? So there's evidence that early mammals, uh, even as far as the Jurassic period, one of the main ways that they survived and thrived was to incorporate a large fermentive base in their digestive system, meaning they picked up microbes from all mm -hmm. around the environment and then housed those microbes in their digestive tract. Now, one of the reasons for that is because um, the most abundant carbon source in, in nature is uh, carbohydrates and plant material, right? It's much easier for a mammal to you know, feed off a bush or a plant or uh, dig in the ground for a root and tuber or grab a fruit or vegetable um, than it is to go hunt and use that energy and the risk that's associated with it. So for the most part, a lot of mammals develop this, this kind of um, salient ability to just kind of gather nutrients from the environment that way. Now, the big problem is mammals in general, and that's including humans, are absolutely horrible at digesting plant matter. Right? We don't have the natural capability to do that. Just one example of that is most plant matter is made up of a compound called cellulose. Right, Most people know that. That's what paper is. Um, so cellulose is the main cons construct of most plant uh, systems. And in order to break down cellulose, you need an enzyme called cellulase. We, as a species, as humans, and most of the mammals, don't make cellulase as a, uh, as a component of our, of our system. And so we're not designed to break down the plant matter. You know, but incorporating a large fermentive base into our system allows us to utilize energy and, and nutrient sources from plant matter to be able to thrive and succeed. Because if we were obligate carnivores, meaning if we only could survive by eating other animals, we would really not do well because it takes a lot of effort and, uh, and energy to go catch another animal, right? So we were able to get by both as a human species and most of the mammals in, in having this mix of being of eating plants and eating animals and, and having this kind of omnivorous diet. Um, and, and that large fermentive base provides a whole plethora of nutrients. Another thing that's really important to note is the actual nutrients in the foods that we eat are really not that diverse, right? That lots of things yeah. we don't get out of the direct foods that we eat. A lot of the most important compounds that we require are secondary metabolites from the fermentation of and the breakdown of those foods in our gut by the microbes. So we've now expanded our plethora of biochemicals and uh, biological material that we can utilize to function as humans by having this really diverse base of microbes in our system that'll take simpler nutrients in and then convert them into much more complex uh, chemistries, you know, the things like organic acids and urolithins and uh, mm. vitamins and all of that stuff are, are synthesized in our gut. They're like, our gut is this amazing nutrient factory. And in order to have all of those functionalities uh, working properly, we need to have a really diverse set of microbes in our gut. And the more diverse, the better, because that means more functionalities for us. And what are some things we can do to help improve the diversity in our gut? 
Yeah. So there's some really simple things. Uh, yeah. The first thing, the first set of things I would say are things that 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 actually negatively impact diversity and, and reducing exposure to those things. Right. So first, of course, is your own uh, personal care products. We've got lots of personal care products that mm -hmm. we expose ourselves to every day that have all kinds of crazy chemicals in them. Uh, you know, preservatives, antimicrobials, antifungals, all of these things that, that end up killing microbes in and on our system, right? So be wary of the lotions you put on, the, the deodorants you use, the soaps you use, you know, all of, if, you're, if you're using makeup, the types of makeup that you use, all of that stuff matters. A simple analogy I give to people is like, if you've ever had house plants or you've cared for plants or garden, you know, you're very careful about what you put in the soil, right? You know that there are certain things you put in there that seem innocuous would probably kill the plant. So the question is, if you're growing a house plant, would you take your lotion and put it in the plant soil? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, do you feel safe enough that that's not going to kill your plant, right? And you look at that ingredient list and you go, well, it's probably going to kill my plant. So if it's going to kill your plant, it's probably not going to be very uh, positive for your overall ecology. So that's one, one simple thing is to just slowly start cleaning up your personal care. Mm -hmm. I started with just trying to find the most clean type of deodorant I can use. And I yeah. can tell you, I've, I've gone through so many brands trying to find one that works for me, right? And then cleaning up the lotions that I use and just doing those kind of things. The second thing is um, within your household itself, the ecosystem in your house is really important. You don't need to sterilize your house in order for your house to be yeah. clean, right? Most surfaces in the house do not need to be Cloroxed and bleached and cleaned. And it doesn't need to have 99.99% .99 of my microbes killed, as you see on a lot of those cleaning bottles. Vast majority of surfaces in my house, we clean with just uh, some water and, and a rag. And we will add a few drops of essential oils to the water just to have some smell. Um, and, and that's how we clean. Toilet bowl, sure, if you want to go in and clean it with some sort of toilet bowl cleaner, go ahead. Uh, but, you know, the surfaces, the tables, countertops and all that, you don't. So those, just those two things will reduce the amount of things you're exposing yourself mm. to that actually harm the diversity in your microbiome. Now, what are some things that can enhance it? Uh, the cheapest thing is fasting. Uh, intermittent fasting, some form of intermittent fasting actually increases the diversity within your microbiome, right? So you actually allow secondary fermenters um, who are, which are groups of bacteria that, that feed off of the metabolic byproducts of the primary digesters in your microbiome, right? So when you eat a meal, uh, the first seven or eight hours of that meal, your primary digesters are going at the main nutrients within the meal. And then they're kicking out secondary metabolites and other um, molecules that would then feed the secondary digesters. Now, what you need is then a break from more food coming in and feeding the primary digesters so that the secondary ones can proliferate and do what they do, right? So as they start proliferating and start digesting all of the, the secondary metabolites that the first primary digesters produce, and then if you throw in a bunch of new food, then they get suppressed because then the primary digesters have to ramp up again, right? So giving your body that time uh, at some point during the day to have somewhere around 12, 13, 14 hours of not taking in calories is really beneficial to your microbiome. It does increase the diversity. Um, another simple thing is trying to increase the diversity in the foods that you eat. You know, Adding in one or two new types of foods each week that you don't normally eat every little difference in foods that you eat will increase the diversity in the bacteria that exists in your gut. Um, taking a spore-based probiotics, we work a lot in the research world with the spore-based probiotics. We've been able to show that when you add in the spores, it actually improves the diversity within the microbiome. They kind of facilitate the growth of microbes that are beneficial, but are who are underperforming. And then they kind of compete against the microbes that are overgrown. So they're kind of bringing back balance to the microbiome. Um, and then, you know, one really important thing is stress, managing stress. Mm -hmm. um, stress, we've all known, certainly in the natural health space, that stress is very disastrous to your system in a number of ways. But when we look at it from the microbiome perspective, one of the first things that stress does is it increases the growth of pathogenic organisms. Right? There are lots of opportunistic pathogens, both viruses and bacteria, that sit uh, dormant in your system waiting to detect stress hormones. Because what they've realized over a period of evolution is that when the host stress hormones are elevated, the immune system 
that controls the, those organisms is suppressed. That's when they start turning on the virulence factors, things like Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, um, streptococcus, Klebsiella, all of these uh, viral and bacterial opportunistic pathogens that live naturally in our system, they turn on their, me uh, their machinery when stress is elevated. And when they do that, they suppress the growth of other beneficial microbes in the system. You know, so just those few simple things, if you can start adding them into your, your routine, you'll really start expanding the diversity in your microbiome. Yeah, really fascinating. And stress also really blocks our ability to produce good digestive juices, stomach mm -hmm. acid, bile, pancreatic enzymes, which are so critical for digestion and for keeping the microbiome intact. Can you talk more about the, the importance of good stomach acid release, bile, all those digestive juices? Yeah, so what's really important about those, and, and we don't look at it from this perspective, I think, because this is kind of what I've been pushing in the, in the medical community, is that um, those com components that we produce, the stomach acid, the bile, just taking those two as, a, as an example, are actually ecological forces that mm -hmm. dictate what the microbiota looks like in those regions of the body, right? And because it dictates what the microbi mi microbiota looks like, what types of organisms can live in that area, it then creates the specific functionality of that part of the organ system, right? So we have ecological forces that we naturally create. Those ecological forces dictate which microbes live in a given area. And based on the microbes that live there, it dictates a function of that organ. Right? So that's the deep connection. The small intestine is dictated, uh, it's a normal function of the small intestine is dictated by having adequate stomach acid and having adequate bile flow. Because those two things, just in a simplistic way, do two really important things. One is the stomach acid prevents all of these dysbiotic bacteria in your mouth from making it into the small intestine in a viable state and colonizing the small intestine. Right? When you look at conditions like SIBO, it's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, the source of the dysbiotic bacteria that are now overgrowing and causing all of these horrific symptomologies in, your, in the small intestine come from the mouth. The mouth harbors somewhere around 26% of all of the microbes in the body, wow. right? It's that. a huge, and, and think about this, the gut harbors 29%. Mm. Think about how big the gut is compared wow. to the mouth, and yet the mouth is pretty close in terms of its microbial diversity and, and, mm -hmm. and genetic elements, right? So the mouth is a major source of dysbiotic bacteria because uh, we've got a lot of different microbes that live in the mouth, and, and of course, uh, the mouth is heavily exposed to the outside world, right? All the food yeah. we put in, things we breathe in, uh, engaging with other people, and so on. So we get a lot of uh, diversity of microbes in the mouth, oftentimes not very good microbes because of course we also if we have poor oral care we're also allowing the overgrowth of pathogens in the mouth as well in the gingival tissues and so then we are swallowing all of those microbes in large amounts every single day through swallowing saliva but this gastric system is there to protect us from having these dysfunctional microbes disrupting the unique uh, ecology of the small intestine mm -hmm. right so the stomach acid is supposed to kill them as it turns out, if we disrupt stomach acid production, either by allowing H. pylori to, to increase and create an infection, or the more potent one, which is the use of PPIs, with mm -hmm. proton pump inhibitors for reflux, then we are going to allow more of this dysbiotic bacteria to get into the small intestine, and it'll eventually create dysbiosis in the small intestine. It's going to um, you know, throw off the balance of the right type of bacteria that are existing in the small intestine. So that it, there's lots of studies that show that PPI use is a form of SIBO. Mm -hmm. It leads to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, right? Now, then the bile, uh, bile secretion, that's, a, that's another really important thing. Bile acts as a really strong antimicrobial. Um, not only is it important, of course, for absorbing fat-soluble vitamins and nutrients, and then also um, sequestering fat-soluble toxins and taking it out through the liver, bile actually sweeps through the intestines throughout the process of digestion, acting as a strong antimicrobial, keeping overgrowth of bacteria contained. Then at the end of the small intestine, it actually stimulates something called an FXR nuclear receptor, which causes your, your small intestine epithelial cells to release antimicrobials. Mm -hmm. so that it maintains a low level of bacterial um, uh, growth. And, and that is a really important mechanism. That's an ecological force that prevents 
overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine. Now, when you start getting these dysbiotic bacteria coming in from the mouth and starting to establish themselves in the small intestine, what they tend to do is start causing an inflammatory response in the lining of the small intestine. When you start getting an inflammatory response in the lining of the small intestine, the lining starts opening up and you start getting the effects of leaky gut. Now, what happens when you have the effects of leaky gut? You've got endotoxemia, right? So LPS now starts leaking in into circulation in the small intestine, going to the liver, because that's one of the first places it goes when it enters mm -hmm. circulation. And then the liver has to deal with that increased toxicity, right? Now, what happens when the liver is dealing with all of this LPS endotoxemia? It starts producing less and less bile. Mm -hmm. And as it starts producing less and less bile, you get more and more overgrowth in the small intestine because that ecological force is no longer there, right? And then you start getting the overgrowth of certain microbes like Bilophila and other ones that can actually then impact the large intestine by compounds that they produce. So it becomes a vicious cycle. You know, we have to become so um, cognizant of changing ecological forces in different mm -hmm. parts of the body, right? The moment we start doing that, we'll change the ecosystem. And when we change the ecosystem, we change the function of that part of the body. Yeah, it's such a good explanation. And you know, we know with stomach acid that really to be able to break down meat like a steak or something like that, we need our stomach acid to be around 1.8 to mm -hmm. 2.5, somewhere in that range. Normally our rest is around 3.0 to 3.5. So it's actually, a, it's actually very energy demanding in order to be able to produce that level of acid. So that's why stress can also deplete that. We wanna be in a relaxed state when we're eating and that stimulates the vagus nerve, parasympathetic nervous system to produce that stomach acid. And then a really acidic bolus goes into the small intestine and triggers the release of bile because it's alkaline, right? So it mm -hmm. comes in and like that combination of strong acid and then alkaline helps to kind of get rid of acid loving bacteria, but then also uh, alkaline loving bacteria kind of helps regulate it all, right? So it's just, it's yeah. amazing how it, all of that works together. And if we don't get a good acidic bolus, we get less stimulation for the bile. Yep. So it's kind of exactly. this vicious cycle that occurs. And, and then along with the endotoxemia, like you're talking about uh, damaging the liver and not allowing it to release that bile. So, you know, really interesting. And there's just so many people, most of the people actually that are listening to this have low stomach acid, poor bile flow. They need to really address these types of issues. And so what are some of the best foods that they can be doing to help support their microbiome? Yeah, um, you know, the microbiome is, is great because it, it can utilize so many different types of foods, right? So you could certainly enhance the growth of your microbiome by eating, you know, uh, lean meats, you can add in some fish, some some steak, and so on. But plant-based material is it becomes the foundation of what the microbiome feeds on. Certainly, the microbiome in your large intestine. Um, you know, again, that's your large fermentive base, right? So yeah. even though you're not necessarily feeding yourself the way we think about eating and feeding, you're really kind of providing important. Uh, base of nutrients to the large fermentive base you have in your in your colon. And so what I try to do myself personally is just try to be as diverse as I can in my diet, um, knowing that adding in uh, foods that are heavily processed, that are packaged, those things have really almost no nutrient value, of course, to us as a host, but also to the microbiome. You know, the microbiome has little utility for those kind of things uh, because they did not evolve, the microbes in our gut did not evolve eating those kind of weird processed compounds. You know, they're, that's, that's not what the bacteria is designed to do, right? They're designed to eat the things that we naturally find in the environment. So that's, to me, the most important cognitive shift for people is that um, the less processed the food is, the more likely it is that we can break it down and our microbes can break it down as well. Um, the more processed it is, the more foreign it looks, not only to our own digestive system, but the microbes that harbor uh, that, that we harbor in our digestive tract as well, right? So that chemical difference in the foods is really a, um, a, a detriment to our ability to actually assimilate nutrients from it, you know, and that, and we'll get calories from the sugar and things like that that are within those processed foods, but we're not gonna get any of the key nutrients. We're not gonna get the secondary fermenters activating because they're not getting their compounds from the primary fermenters who can't break down these weird compounds. And, uh, and, and eventually that just starts to shrink the, the uh, diversity in the microbiome. You know, So my biggest 
thing to people, whether you fall into the, you know, I'm a carnivore camp or a vegan camp or vegetarian, whatever camp you're in, the idea is really to eat as much real food as you can mm. and try to be as ex, uh, expansive and diverse in your diet. Yeah, that's good. And and also you talked about intermittent fasting and we know that from research, intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding helps to improve the amount of acromanza mucinophilia. Mm -hmm. And that's called, a, uh, what is it, a keystone bacteria, right? That mm -hmm. That's really key when we see that show up on stool tests, usually yeah. a sign of very good, uh, you know, healthy diversity and, and metabolic health. Can you talk more about that bacteria and what it does? Yeah, it's so what's fascinating about Acromantia, it's the um, only uh, species in the Acromantia genus that's in the gut. So in your gut, you've got typically a number of different species from a particular genus. So take Lactobacillus, for example, you've got Gasserae in there, Acidophilus, Rhamnosus, you've got all kinds of different Lactobacilli. But in, in the case of Acromantia, Mucinophila is the only species. And, and in healthy individuals, it can make up upwards of 5% of the total microbiome. That's how important wow. it is, right? It's a, it's a huge player in your microbiome. And the studies are really clear that it's inversely correlated with a huge number of health conditions, certainly everything under the cardiometabolic spectrum, which is almost 60 different disease conditions. Oh. Right, the most common things are obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, senile dementia, all of these things that fall under that cardiometabolic syndrome. And at the higher acromancer you have, the lower risk you have of all of those conditions. Um, acromancer plays such an important role in energy balance in the body, in, in glucose tolerance and, and burning of fat and being able to trigger fat burning. It also is a really important cross feeder for other microbes in the system. So when you start to see elevated levels of acromancia, you start to understand that you've got now a more stable and diverse microbiome. Um, so it's such a critical organism, we cannot say enough. And I would say that one of the epidemics that we face in the Western world is an epidemic of the absence of acromancia. Because when we look at the types of conditions that typically kill us, right? Um, so barring things like accidents and all that, when it's a disease-based, uh, you know, death for people in the U.S., somewhere around six, seven out of ten adults in the U.S. will succumb to a condition that is associated with having low to no acromancia. You know, and that's yeah. it's it, to me, it's no coincidence, right? Um, so, so just being able to increase the growth of that one organism will afford a significant amount of protection and resilience to give you the better, the best health outcomes that you could possibly have. So, no. uh, you know, and, and one of the things that's critical to note is that if you're not taking these specific strides to improve certain parts of your microbiome, critical parts like diversity, like the growth of keystone strains like acromancia, supplementation and all that is makes it very hard to overcome the dysfunction that are driven by those foundational problems, right? If you have really low diversity, you have the absence of keystone strains like acromancia, fecalum bacteria, all the other things that you do to be healthy will have less effect because you're, you're, it's so hard to overcome the foundational issues of not having these microbes in your system. Mm. So to me, that becomes such an important basement level uh, focus for people when it comes to health and wellness. We got to get the right microbes at the right levels in the system. And then all the other things you do, the exercise, the healthy eating, the supplementation, all those other things will become much more effective. Yeah, that's, that's really good. And acromantia mucinophilia, mucinophilia means loving the mucus, loves the mucus layer. So it sits in that mucus layer. And you were talking about kind of the primary eaters, right? Or the primary mm -hmm. fermenters and the secondary. So it's way down at the bottom. So yep. if we're constantly eating, you know, every few hours, it's really not all the foods going to the primary fermenters and it's yep. not getting it down there. But it, it lives in that mucosa and it will eat that mucosa. And particularly when we're taking longer periods of time between meals or doing time-restricted feeding, now we start to see that grow and develop. Mm -hmm. And would it be correct to say that it helps create a more resilient and hearty and strong uh, intestinal membrane, right? The actual mucus layer helping protect against leaky gut and intestinal permeability. Yeah, so that's important. So uh, I'll go back to this diagram because... Um, one thing that's important to note is this mucosa, which is a, in a very, oops, sorry, this one, which is a very important barrier grows from the inside, right? 
So there are cells in here, like these green cells called the goblet cells. Mm. These goblet cells are the things that produce the mucus layer. And like your skin that grows from the inside and pushes outward, um, the mucosa should be constantly growing and regenerating from the inside and then sloughing off at the very top, taking toxins and other bacteria and all that off with it, right? And so the regeneration of the mucosa is stimulated by two things. One is the activation of a gene called the MUC-T gene. And then number two is the activation of these goblet cells, these important goblet cells that produce um, the mucus itself. Acromantia does two things with, related, with relation to that. As it eats away at the mucus layer, it creates a stimulation to activate the MUC-T gene. Mm. So that tells our body that, hey, we need to reproduce more mucosa. Then it also helps the production of short chain fatty acids, especially butyrate. Mm. And when it produces butyrate, that is the primary fuel that the goblet cells need mm. in order to produce this mucin layer, right? So Ackermansia's role in eating, eating and diet, feeding on the um, <clears throat> mucosa becomes a really important part of regenerating that, that new mucosa layer. And, and if your gut is healthy and working well, within 72 hours, you can generate a whole new mucosa layer, new healthy mucosa layer. Um, and if your gut is not healthy and you have low levels of acromancy, it's going to take much longer. So now over time, what happens is you get all this trappings of toxins and pathogens and all in the mucus layer because that's part of what it does right it grabs things and it captures things um and and you're not sloughing it off and you're not getting rid of those things so you end up with a net contaminated mucosa that's not being regenerated yeah and is the research has the research shown like the the ideal time frame for intermittent fasting for, for time restricted feeding to really get a development of the acromancia? So uh, with, with respect to the acromancia, no. The, it seems like any sort of period of fasting or time restricted mm. feeding will provide acromancia that, that period of being able to um, regenerate itself. My guess would be based on the diurnal system in the in microbiome, meaning it, it also works off of this, this uh, 24 hour clock similar yeah. to our own circadian rhythm, that acromancy is probably particularly active in the nighttime. So, mm -hmm. you know, as, you, as we're not eating through the, through the nighttime, um, and later in the evening when, when your body starts detecting that it's the nighttime yeah. with the sun going down, that's probably the time in which it's becoming more active. Um, there, there are studies that show that if your fasting period is more from the early afternoon mm -hmm. uh, through the morning, that actually has a more beneficial mm -hmm. metabolic impact. Right, which to me is a harder way to do it. Um, I'm much better at being able to skip breakfast and and have my first meal as a late lunch, and and then of course being able to have dinner. Dinner becomes a lot more of a social yeah, thing right. for most people, right? I'm often having dinner with friends, family, and so on. So it becomes for me practically harder to to have my meal as the morning and early lunch, and then skip yeah. uh, the afternoon and evening meal. So I don't do it that way. But mm -hmm. there are studies that show that that format of it mm -hmm. has more impact on weight and and yeah. metabolic response. So that may be uh, uh, that may also yeah, then I like that. that. Acromancy is better that way. It's I like that. Better. I think for the listeners that are dealing with chronic inflammation, a good goal would be try to do that once a week where you mm -hmm. skip dinner, right? Yep. Um, in fact, I do that on Wednesday. So today we're doing this interview. It's Wednesday. I ate lunch mm -hmm. and then I do a 24 hour fast till lunch tomorrow. And you know, I, I, I feel so much better actually doing it lunch to lunch than a dinner to dinner, which I've done yeah. many times before too. So totally. I try to incorporate that once a week it plays, it plays a big role. Let's talk about, uh, probiotics, mm -hmm. right? So probiotics are one of the most common supplements people have heard of. Many people are taking, um, how do they impact the microbiome and what should we be looking for in probiotics? Yeah, you know, one of the sad things about the probiotic industry in general is that very few companies, if any that I can think of, actually do studies on the product that they, uh, products that they sell to show what it actually does to the microbiome. So I can say with a great deal of confidence that the vast majority of probiotics that people have access to, we have no idea what it does to the microbiome, right? We don't know taking 200 billion CFUs a day of 15, 20 different strains, how that impacts the microbiome over time. There was a study from the Israeli Academy that showed that those kinds of probiotics actually slow down the recovery of the microbiome after a course of antibiotics, right? And, and logically to me, that makes sense because now what you're taking is, um, you know, mimics of your endogenous bacteria 
and then you're putting it into a, a compromised system and the, the risk of having those mimics um, compete with your endogenous bacteria, the versions of, the, of your endogenous bacteria is elevated, right? So are those microbes in the 200 billion, 100 billion, 50 billion CFU multi-strain products, are they actually competing with your microbiome or are they somehow assisting the microbes in your microbiome? We don't know because companies don't study it. And, yeah. and that's the part that really bothered me about the whole probiotic industry when I got into it about 10 years ago is we can't just assume that we could take this mass of bacteria and just assume it's beneficial to your system by throwing it in all the time, right? We need actual science to figure that out. So we started, when we started working with the spores, our first question was, how does it impact the rest of the microbiome? You know, is it hanging out in there and is it competing with the endogenous bacteria? Is it somehow taking up more real estate than it should? You know, does it actually increase the growth of the good bacteria or bring it down or, or is it completely agnostic in your gut, right? So those are the things that we really wanted to figure out. And fortunately, what we, what we see with the spores is they have a real uh, positive impact on the rest of the microbiome, enhancing diversity, enhancing the presence of keystone strain. So I would say for the most part, when you're taking other conventional back, uh, probiotic uh, products, we really don't know what it's doing to the microbiome. So there's a long-term concern for me in taking those products. I don't, I think any sort of risk would be quite minimal if you take them for a short mm -hmm. period of time, um, you know, a couple of months here and there. But if you're taking them every day for the next several years, we really don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so how do the spore formers work? You talked a little bit about that earlier. Let's go into more detail because you've got a great product that uh, I use, my health coaching team, we use this with, with a lot of our, our clients, Mega Spore Biotics, one of the now I would say probably one of the most well-known probiotics really because of the results that it gets and, and the research that you guys have been doing. So let's talk about how that works. Yeah, I, you know, and now I think as of today, we have nine published studies on, on the product itself. Um, so we're getting a really, really strong understanding of mm. what it's actually doing in the system. Um, and a lot of the clues as to what these spores actually do in the system came from early animal studies uh, because they've been using spores in the animal, the feed industry for a while uh, because these are universal colonizers, right? These are, in, these are environmental bacteria that have a capability of surviving through the digestive tract and, and actually getting to the intestine in a viable state and in a well-functioning state. So they have the ability to colonize in many different types of guts. That includes animals that we live with and so on, dogs, cats, you know, the cows we eat and so on. Um, so in the veterinary space, they had been doing studies on leaky gut for a long period of time. And the reason for that is the economics of, of farmed animals dictates that any degree of mortality, any degree of illness has a huge impact to the bottom line, right? If they have 1% mortality rate and you're growing as a company, you know, 400 million chickens in a year, that 1% uh, mortality rate really has an impact on your bottom line. And so they've been really investing in studying things like leaky gut, uh, inflammation, you know, uh, assimilation, the ability of the animals to digest and assimilate nutrients because they want them to grow faster. Um, and so when we first saw that, we said, wow, there, there's a lot of studies on spores in the animal uh, space. And what they found in the animal space was that the spores improve the expression of the tight junction protein, so it kept the gut sealed. It increased the production of the mucus layer. It increased the height of the actual microvilli in the intestines, and it seemed to ward off problematic, problematic and pathogenic organisms. It also was able to neutralize a lot of environmental toxins that have a huge impact on the lining of the gut, things like uh, DON, which is a, 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 um, an, a, an abbreviation for a really long name, of a fungal based toxin that you find in agricultural products. And so it had this real protective quality within the gut. Then we started looking at human studies and the use of it in humans. And we found that since 1952, they've been prescription probiotics in Europe and Latin America and Southeast Asia. And they were using them primarily to treat gut infections mm -hmm. because the spores are so good at going in there using something called quorum sensing, so reading the microbial environment, and then identifying problematic or pathogenic organisms, honing in on that space, and then bringing down the growth of those pathogenic organisms. And so because of that, they are kind of like a highly selective 
antibiotic, if you will, right? They, they don't go in there and create an atom bomb that kills everything. They'll go in there and specifically target the problematic organisms. So just seeing those two things, saying, seeing the ability of them to protect the, the digestive tract from toxins, uh, improve the barrier function, the mucosa, the tight junctions, the height of the microvilli, and then, and then of course, the protection against pathogens. We said, oh, this is really interesting as a probiotic. Our big hypothesis was if it can if it can seek out and bring down the growth of problematic bacteria, it probably has the capacity to improve the growth of really important commensal bacteria. That was our hypothesis, and we were the ones to show that through clinical studies um, and and other you know in vitro studies as well how we can improve the growth hmm. of commensal bacteria in, in addition to all of those other protective benefits. Right, so that the spores are really kind of the gut police. They're the cleanup yeah. crew. Um, they maintain the right balance within the gut, and we've outsourced a lot of those functions to these spores with the idea that we live with them, right? Throughout the course of human evolution, uh, upwards of the last, uh, until the last 60, 70 years, we lived uh, a lifestyle that, that kept us in really close contact with these types of spores. And, and because of that, we co-evolved where we provide them a home as a host, and then they come in and they clean up the house. And uh, it's only in the last you know, few decades that we've created these kind of concrete jungles and sterile environments that we spend most of our time in where we get no exposure to these spores. So those functionalities are absent in our system. Hmm. So for us, it was just a matter of being smart enough to identify their function and then bring them back into our system. You know, and that, that's, that's all we did. And then of course, invest a lot in studying what they're actually doing in the system. Yeah, it's a perfect symbiotic relationship. You know, I first actually learned about him through uh, my friend Jordan Rubin. He wrote a book, The Maker's Diet, yep. back in like 2004, New York Times bestseller. And he tried every, he had Crohn's disease, tried every type of probiotic. It wasn't until he found spore-forming probiotics that he yep. started seeing results. And that was kind of part of his big story there. And uh, obviously, you guys have done a ton of research with these. So you're the leading experts when it comes to formulating these. And do you find that people get better results taking them with meals or away from meals? So in general, we, we encourage people to take it with meals um, because naturally in the natural world, you'd be getting larger exposure to the spores with food, right? As you dig for roots and tubers, you gather, you pick, you kill an animal and eat it. That's when you get the large amount of spores into your system. And they also play an important role in the digestive process and the, the ability to break down food and actually assimilate them. Uh, spores are very well known for producing loads of digestive enzymes. You know, in fact, lots of the commercial digestive enzymes that we buy are produced by spores commercially. You know, lots of the proteases, for example, Bacillus lycniformis produces a whole host of, of um, acid stable proteases, which are used of course in industry um, and, and as supplements. And so, um, you know, them functioning in the presence of food is really, to me, the most effective mm -hmm. way to take them. Yeah, it's good to know. And so usually you recommend starting, starting low dosages and then gradually building up because they're strong, they're powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they'll make, they'll make change in your gut, yeah. right? And, and for some people that change can, can be uncomfortable uh, in the first few days. It can present as cramping, bloating, maybe some loose stool. Um, and, and to kind of dampen that change effect, we kind of taper up slowly. Um, most people have heard of the whole die-off effect, right? One of the things that the spores do when they come in there, um, you know, they're competing with these problematic bacteria and those problematic bacteria, as they are succumbing and as they're dying, they actually release lots of toxins and they release, you know, it's kind of like a Hail, Hail Mary as they're trying their last ditch effort to survive. And, and that can create um, you know, detox re response in some people. It's hard to predict who gets that kind of response. We, when we first started working with the probiotics, we assumed our most frail and, and sensitive people were the ones that would get that kind of response. You know, the more robust people wouldn't. We didn't see that being a uniform uh, you know, finding. And so what we started suggesting was that everybody kind of taper up. And so that you go slowly, slowly and then you kind of uh, dampen that response. Yeah, now, that response is actually a positive thing. You know, I, I actually get excited when I hear that people are having some sort of response in the first few days because it's indicating a change is happening mm. within the yeah. system. 
Yep, absolutely. And that's what we're trying to do is shake up the system, especially somebody that's got a really dysbiotic, damaged gut. So we've got to shake things up and uh, create change and adaptation. Now, another product that I really like is the Mega IgG that you guys have. Let's talk yeah. about that. This is bovine serum uh, immunoglobins yeah. right, and how that impacts our body and our immune system. Yeah. Uh, immunoglobulins from, from bovine serum sources are, are really interesting and phenomenal products. So it's IgG immunoglobulins. So it's the long-term, uh, highly specific immunoglobulins that, that the cow's immune system has generated. And it's generated that um, in response to all kinds of things that the cow is exposed to, right, in the outside environment, things like viruses and bacteria and mold and environmental toxins and so on. So the cow's immune system as a cow is growing is constantly developing these immunoglobulins. So those are a lot of those things are also the kinds of things that create toxicity and inflammation in our digestive tract, right? So if we get exposed to a lot of those kinds of things on a daily basis, it provide, it, it creates um, a load, a burden on our immune system. Mm. And, uh, and then if our gut is dysbiotic at the same time, it's going to drive your immune system into a very inflammatory state and very inflammatory response. And so the immunoglobulins from the, from the bovine serum source come in there and provide a source of highly specific detoxing compounds, proteins, if you will. So they are antibodies. They're highly specific to certain antigens. So when they go into the digestive tract, they're basically swimming around your mucosa and anything that they fit, with, that they come across, whether it's a virus, a bacteria, a mold toxin, you know, we, we know they have studies on it that show they neutralize 13 different mycotoxins, mm. um, you know, even main things like aflatoxin, for example, they neutralize C. diff bacterial toxins, they neutralize virus particles, um, you know, they can neutralize lots of different things. And it's basically taking a toxic burden off of your gut and off of your gut microbiome and off of your uh, immune system. Um, and in people that are recovering or trying to recover from a condition, that's a huge helping hand to your system. Um, and it's really quite amazing because it's really designed initially as a as something to treat the, the gut and dysfunctions in the gut. The medical food version of it, which is really the same active ingredient, is used to treat chronic diarrhea. These are people that have um, you know, four, five, six episodes of loose stool a day, every day, right, for long periods of time, because they've got all kinds of dysbiosis going on in the gut, typically co uh, connected to things like inflammatory bowel conditions. But the supplement version, which is kind of basically the same active ingredient, we're finding all kinds of effects in people. You know, I've had people talk about positive changes in their cholesterol and their anxiety. And, you know, and we, because we work with health practitioners, we get really good case reports mm -hmm. back from them. Um, and we're seeing that when you bring down the toxic load, that you really start to see changes systemically areas peripheral to the gut. Um, you know, and, and the, it fits in a, along the line of this whole detox concept. Yeah, right? like a binder, I was thinking. It's a, it's a binder, but it's a, what the beauty of it is a highly specific binder. Right. Right, because one of the problems with binders, if you use them long term, is they do also bind good stuff. Right, yeah, like they activated will, charcoal or something like that. Yeah, very inexpensive to get, but it's not specific. It's not specific. It's just kind of moving yeah. through like a mudslide, if you will, and just grabbing everything at the top layer of the mucosa, so which is good bacteria, nutrients, things like that. It can do that. Now, in some cases, you may need that kind of response for a short period of time, but as a general daily kind of detox and binder, this is highly specific and goes after the things that are causing inflammation. Mm. Now, do you find that it's best to take that with or without meals? Where are you so get I meals? tend, yeah, I tend to take that um, right before a meal or in between meals. Okay. Um, I, I use that um, as one of my things that I take at night. So uh, mm -hmm. it's actually the, one of the things I take about 30 minutes or so before my first meal. And yeah. then I take another dose of it at night before bed um, right. as your gut microbiome is going through this whole cleanup process that's happening in the digestive tract, right? And I want to send in some of these immunoglobulins to help the system kind of clean up. Um, now, and, because it's protein, because it does have like some calories in it and it's protein, do you find that it breaks a fast or that it just helps enhance the fasting process? Yeah, it doesn't make a fast because it won't, uh, it won't create a change in insulin. Uh, it doesn't create an insulin spike. Mm -hmm. And it also is not the kind of protein that we would digest right. and actually assimilate, right? So it stays in that 
top layer of the mucosa and, and, and start binding things and neutralizing mm -hmm. things. Um, our bodies, our digestive tracts are not inclined to digest immunoglobulins because right. the largest secretion of immunoglobulins is in our digestive mucosa, the IgA, right? Mm -hmm. And we count on IgA as a really important neutralizer of you know, uh, primary invading pathogens and so on. And so our, our digestive system is not inclined to digest immunoglobulins. So it won't see it, your system doesn't see it as a source of food, if you will. Yeah, that's, that's good. Now, you guys also made a great mega prebiotic uh, product as well. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, you know, I've had a, a, a love of oligosaccharides for a long time because mm -hmm. oligosaccharides are such fascinating compounds. Um, they're found in, in different types of fruits and vegetables. You can get some from uh, eating connective tissue or organ meat in animals. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're sources of them. But you've got the main ones that are called fructo oligosaccharides, abbreviated FOS, which come from the core typically of certain fruits. You've got galacto oligosaccharides, which becomes a, a derivative of dairy. Uh, it's somewhere in there in the dairy components, and then it, it can be pulled out and separated from the dairy proteins and so on. Uh, and then you've got xylo oligosaccharides, which come from vegetable sources. And, and what's amazing about oligosaccharides is they have very unique structures to them. Their physical structure is complex and unique to a point where they specifically feed certain groups of bacteria. Because they're so complex, they don't generally feed microbes in the gut. They, they require bacteria that have highly specific enzymes to break down these complex structures. And, and it's important to note that, that the microbiome's first food for a long period of time are oligosaccharides because you know most babies that are born in the first six months or so all they're eating is or getting this breast milk right. breast milk contains over 200 different types of oligosaccharides hmm. in it wow. almost i think it's almost 30 percent of the of the physical content of breast milk are oligosaccharides that the baby wow. can't digest for energy it's all there to see hmm. and feed the bacteria right that's so interesting yeah it's so i mean so that's why you know and i'm always uh looking at evolutionary significance of things that we do, that's why I kind of honed in on oligosaccharides because nature has decided over millions of years of evolution that these types of compounds are critical for our gut bacteria. And so once we stop the breastfeeding and we go into the normal Western diet, we get almost no oligosaccharides into our diet, right? We, because we just don't eat uh, the cores of, of vegetables and fruits. We don't eat enough volume of those yeah. things to really get those, those uh, high amounts of oligosaccharides. So we focused in on these really specific oligosaccharides that have clinical studies showing they have the ability to feed keystone strains. And that is, to me, the most important aspect of it, because we are not, as a society, doing much to feed our keystone strains. The, the acromancias, the fecalum bacteria, the ones that are very protective of us and the rest of the microbiome. So we created this mega pre product that has these key oli uh, oligosaccharides um, that are highly selective to feed the keystone strains. Yeah, really interesting. Now, typically when you guys are working with, um, obviously with practitioners, you kind of created a customized protocol. And mm -hmm. you know, obviously many of the people that are listening to this are dealing with chronic gut issues, chronic inflammation affecting multiple parts of their body. So usually you start with kind of like a, a cleanup phase where you're using the mega spore biotic, the mega IgG, kind of in the early stages, <clears throat> start to switch over that microbiome mm -hmm. and then starting to rebuild and really work on that gut mucosa with the mega mucosa product, which has a bunch of polyphenols and amino acids. And um, also it's got some more of the IgG in there too. Yep. And then kind of shifting into the feeding stage, right? Where you're re-inoculating the healthy gut bacteria. Can you, can you go through that in more detail? Yeah, so we, we call it the total gut restoration system, or yeah. TGR, right? Um, and when, when we looked at, like, how do you go about uh, restoring the gut? Like, what are the steps we need to take? And we, we talked to a lot of our docs that we work with, um, you know, and have been working with for seven, eight years. And we saw a, a kind of discrepancy in, in the process that occurs in trying to repair the gut. Um, oftentimes, what will happen is uh, we, we will take in compounds or like, let's say some patient comes in and they're highly dysbiotic, their gut is a big mess. They've got a bunch of issues and conditions, uh, both digestive, immunological, and so on. And then you start giving them things like glutamine and you start giving them things like, um, you know, aloe and so on, 
with the hope that um, that we're starting to fade, fix the gut lining and the mucosa mm -hmm. and so and so on, without having addressed the dysbiosis that's there, right? Because the the components, the main players within the gut that actually do the repair are the microbes, and right. and so this idea was we got to fix the microbes first. Right, because until you fix the microbes, you really cannot make any big steps in repairing the other systems within the gut, the immunological system and the barriers, the actual physical barriers. Um, the analogy I use is like, it's, it's like having a broke down car on your driveway and then taking a bag of tools and throwing it at the car and going, okay, fix yourself, right? Yeah. It just can't do it. You need an intelligent mechanic there to use the tools in order to repair the car. The microbiome is the mechanic of the, of the, of the gut. And so our thinking was, okay, step one is we got to recondition the gut microbiome, meaning we got to make those important changes. We got to increase diversity. We got to start increasing the growth of those keystone strains. We got to start bringing down the growth of the problematic strains that have been driving the condition. And so that's phase one of it. And that typically we have people do for somewhere around four weeks. Um, and that's typically with just the probiotic, just the megaspore. Yeah. Then as, as the megaspore starts making those positive changes, the increase in the keystone strains, the increase in diversity and so on, we wanna reinforce those changes so that it becomes more of your permanent microbiome. Because even you're making, even as you're making the changes, your microbiome is still tenuous mm -hmm. and can still revert back quickly to your dysfunctional state given stressors, right? right? And so let's say you just have a weekend of just going out and partying and eating yeah. terribly, or you have a course of antibiotics, it'll throw you back in that dysbiotic state. And so as we are reconditioning the microbiome, we wanna reinforce these changes so you build more permanency and more resilience in this new looking mm -hmm. microbiome. So then in the second part, we bring in the prebiotic, which specifically enhances all of those new um, effects within the microbiome. Then the last part of it is the, the repair starts, right? So we go okay, recondition, yeah. reinforce, and then repair. That's when we provide the microbiome with the tools that they need in order to repair the mucosa, the tight junctions, the immune response. So that's when we throw in the polyphenols, we throw in the amino acids, which are the building yeah. blocks of a lot of those, um, those structures. The IgG is in there as an added enhancer mm. to bring down the toxicity that's going on so that it can be repaired, right? So one of the things that negates repair in the gut is continuous toxicity and inflammatory response. If the system is inflamed, it cannot repair. It's in that state of inflammation. So one of the things that IgG does in the, in the repair phase in the mucosa product is it helps dampen that, that inflammatory side of things and allows for repair to occur. Now, in some cases, what we do, if, if someone's got a really messed up dysbiotic gut, we start them with a the megaspore and we start them with the standalone IgG at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Because we yeah. know that their gut is, is, is heavily dysbiotic, yeah. basically history and so on. And, um, and then that way the spores have some additional help in, in, in making a change in the microbiome, right? With the IgG there. And that's what and, I've been doing with clients. Yeah. yeah. And it can be really powerful. Yeah. I mean, the combination of those two things are yeah. extremely powerful in a lot of people. Yeah. I've seen that. You know, having that extra binder, specific binder, really, I've, I've seen really amplify the results of the mega probiotics. So, yeah, yeah, really good stuff. Now, last thing I want to ask you was, uh, you guys made a new product for really for kind of the respiratory microbiome, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that before we finish up here. Yeah, so that product's called Megasidin. Um, mm -hmm. What was really exciting about the product is it really stemmed from a conversation I had with uh, Dr. Simon Cutting, who's one of the preeminent spore researchers in the world, um, at, at a dinner like three years ago, um, where he was talking about some work he was doing on the impact of the spores interacting with the buccal immune tissue, right? So in your mouth, uh, you've got, of course, tons of bacteria like we talked about, but also you have a lot of immune tissue in the mouth. And the immune tissue in the mouth as it becomes stimulated, if it's, if it's stimulated in the right way, um, creates robust immune response in the upper respiratory tract and in the oral cavity, which of course is your primary site of entry mm. to the vast majority of pathogens and things that could potentially make you ill and impact your system. And so uh, what, he was, what he was studying and showing was that when you keep the spores in the mouth and they interact with the buccal immune tissue, they create this kind of robust um, Im immune response 
in the upper respiratory and in the oral cavity. So that buccal stimulation becomes so important. And uh, when we were looking at that, we, we paired up with uh, Biobotanical, who has that great uh, you know, biocidin product mm -hmm. that has been around for a long time. Lots of people use it. It has yeah. uh, immune stimulatory effect in the, in, the, in the oral cavity as well, based on some of the herbs that are in there. And we said, okay, I wonder if we can use that as a carrier to send to to provide the exposure of the spores into the buccal cavity, and and sure enough, we incubated it because it is known to be an antimicrobial. So we incubated the spores in it. Spores are perfectly stable in that spray, and so we added into the spray to provide huge amounts of extra value to the actual spray. And then that also gives us a way of uniformly distributing the spores in the buccal uh, immune immune tissue. Eventually, you'll end up swallowing them, which is which is great. No, but no. but for a period of time, you'll get that immune response. Um, and for me, as walking around most days, I want my upper respiratory oral immune system to kind of be at a ready state, you know, because yeah. they're going to be the ones that are first encountering anything I might breathe in or get exposed to. So a couple of sprays of that a day as you go along. And then certainly if you if you ever start to get a throat uh, you know, sensitivity or issue, your throat starts to hurt, you start to feel things dripping in. That's when it really becomes really effective as well because as a throat spray, because the biocidin component of it has already been well established as a highly effective throat spray. On top of that, then you get the buccal immune uh, stimulation from the spores. So um, it's just, a, it's one of those things that, that to us look like one plus one equals three. It's like an added value. Um, so we were very excited to, to launch it. Especially yeah, it's so great that you were able to, to create that connection and, uh, and combine those products. Yeah, you know, and, and to us, it's especially important now because all of the data that we're seeing from the marketplace is that immune-based products are gonna fly through the roof because yeah. everyone is concerned about how their immune system is working, right? Totally. And so what we wanted to do is provide practitioners and, and people that we work with uh, in our channels um, with really unique and, and highly powerful immune support products that they can then offer to their clients. Yeah, if there's anything that, uh, you know, 2020 told us, it's got to take care of your immune system now, right? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, yep. it's every day you got to be working on your immune system, that's for sure. So totally. yeah, you guys made a great product there. So I'm excited to, to start using that. And um, yeah, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge you before we finish here, just your, your, your depth of research, um, everything that you're, you're getting yourself involved in and your ability to really clairvoyantly communicate this, right? It's so simple and easy to, uh, I mean, it's complex topics, but you're so great at really breaking it down and making it easy for people. And I think the, the listeners have gotten a lot out of this interview. So uh, as we finish up, any last words of advice or inspiration for people? Yeah, you know, one of the things I often say to people is, you know, we live in an era of amazing hope when it comes to health and wellness, right? Because of, of, of the advent of the microbiome research, we are uh, understanding our form and function way more than we have in the last hundred years combined. Um, in the last five years, there's been over 50,000 published studies on the microbiome. So it's, it's going to be, for a long period of time, the biggest evolution in, in medicine. And, um, and as we learn about the microbiome more, what we come to learn is that so much of the things that ail us are, are attributable to an ecological dysfunction in our microbiota, which is great news because if it's an ecological dysfunction, it means we can fix it. You know, we used to think that most of these disease conditions that we struggle with are driven by genetic dysfunctions in us, that every disease had a gene that was associated with it. Yeah. And you can't change your genes, right? So if you've got the Alzheimer's gene, then hey, you're screwed. You're gonna get Alzheimer's at some point, right? But now we come to know that even though you might have a genetic risk for Alzheimer's, your lifestyle, your microbiome, your immune system, how those things are taken care of over periods of time will make a big difference uh, on whether or not you ever develop the condition. So there are, there's so much hope out there that we are really understanding how we are, how we are structured, how we function, and so many seemingly uncurable conditions over the next several years are going to have really potent microbiome uh, cures to them. So that is, we live in an exciting time. Um, and, and then, you know, one more statement on, on, 
the current atmosphere of things, you know, if if you're watching the political scene, if you're watching, you know, what's happening with, with COVID and all that, there's so much uncertainty out there, right? Yeah. It, it creates so much angst and anxiety of people. True. It gives people a sense of uh, lack of control and, and a hopelessness. Lack of control creates anxiety. Hopelessness gives you depression. So we've got this, this era where we are now prone to feeling anxious and depressed because of all of the crazy things that are going on out there that we cannot control. Know this, that one thing you can control is what happens to your system, That's right? right? So right. this is a great time to focus inward and go, I can't control all these crazy things that are going on out there. So I'm just going to put those to the side, focus inward and focus on your own system, build resilience, build health, build wellness. That's going to really be the thing that services you in the long term. Worrying about all the crazy things that are happening in the world today only makes you sicker, you know? And so, so I'm trying to do that myself. I'm trying to kind of take more stock in improving my own health and wellness right now uh, in this crazy time. And, and, and I think it, people will be well served to do that for themselves. Absolutely. hundred percent agree. You know, and that's an empowering message that we're in control of our health and we've got to really take action. We've given you tons of resources and strategies here to start taking action. You can check out Kieran at Microbiome Labs. So check that out. And uh, you can check out all the great products that we talked about, Mega Sporbiotic, talked about Mega IgG, Mega Prebiotic, Mega Mucosa, and the Mega, what was it? Um, Mega Sidon. Mega Sidon, exactly. That's right. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Kieran. And for those of you guys that are listening, go out and start taking action. We'll see you on a future interview. Be blessed.